I had fully expected to finish 1 Peter tonight, but I just couldn't. Uh, it would have just been too much. And tonight we're looking at some very familiar verses, I think. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize those. And what we've been looking at in chapter 5 basically are attitudes of spiritual maturity. Uh, they're, they're things that as you grow in the Lord, uh, these will be more and more characteristic uh, of your Christian life. We, we looked at faithfulness. Uh, listen, as, as a person matures in life and in Christianity, uh, you'll, be more mat- you'll be more faithful. You know, people can count on you. Uh, we looked at uh, submission and humility. As you mature, it's not all about you anymore. And it's not just you know, how it affects you. There's a submission. You're, you're fitting in where you're supposed to in a humility. Uh, verse 7, we looked at, at trust. Uh, you know, casting our, our care upon the Lord. As you grow up, you begin, to, you begin to trust the Lord. And tonight we're going to be looking at self-control and vigilance. Uh, they're part of growing up, and, and you'll see that. Let's read uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, just verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So two a- admonitions there in verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. And uh, they make up the heading that I've used for my title, Be Watchful. Be Watchful. Uh, the first one, Be Sober. Uh, it, it has to do with, sometimes the Bible uses the word temperate, uh, self-control. Uh, it has to do with the inner you. Being sober has to do with how you, how you look at life. And, and I found it interesting that verses 5 through 7 uh, really have quite an application to this. Let me read those. Uh, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And those, those verses really have a, a lot to do with looking to God's order of things. That's, that's one of the areas that uh, being sober has to do with. It's looking at life, uh, not in a casual or in a careless way, but looking at it, well, what does God intend here? What does God intend for me? What does God intend for, uh, for my life to be? You know, being in submission to God and His Word, uh, being humble and, and trusting the Lord. Now, what we want to look at just uh, first off is some things that are involved in being sober. And we're going to go to a couple of other scriptures. Now, I'll say this. He's not talking here about not being drunk, but that too. <laughs> yeah, as Christians, we don't, he says it's not right for us to get drunk. But the, the main characteristic here is, is, is he's not talking about that. Unfortunately, words get used in, in one way or another, and we, we think that's the only meaning. Uh, but he's talking here about our, our attitude toward life. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6, He gives us the first one we'll look at, and that is don't sleep. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6. That doesn't mean never sleep, but uh, uh, don't sleep when you're not supposed to be asleep. Um, It just means watch, watch. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. He he relates it there to being sober. Um, Some people are just, you know, use the expression asleep at the wheel. You know, when, when you need to be paying attention, they're, they're not. God wants us to be sober. Uh, someone has said something like, uh, some people make things happen. Some people have things happen to them. Others say, what happened? <laughs> and that's when you're asleep. You know? That's when you're not watching. Uh, God doesn't want us just to let life happen to us. Uh, he wants us to watch and be careful, be sober. Uh, put another way, don't blame others for your life. I think that's a pretty good, good way to put, put it. Plan ahead. Watch. Be careful. Uh, you know, not the old, she'll be right, mate, attitude. Now watch. Secondly, use God's armor. That's the next thing there in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse 7. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober 
putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation uh, by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And he relates uh, being sober to putting on the armor of God. And what we're talking about here is knowing what you have in Christ. As Christians, we need to know the truth about what God has done for us. Uh, in our studies on, on Wednesday nights, uh, you know, quieting a, a noisy soul, uh, we're, we're looking at that. How that, you know, many times we, we, we just don't have the, the belief, uh, we don't have the understanding to, to know, well, God has done this for me, and God has done that for me, and God has, has worked this out for me. Uh, not going to the next step where we know what God has said and we don't believe it, you know. Uh, but we need to know what God has said and what God has done. And if you work your way through the, the armor, uh, the thing I always have to remind myself and others is it, it's not really, you know, the point is not that it's armor, it's that it's those things. Uh, salvation. You know, God has given us salvation. Uh, that, that should change our thoughts. You know, he talks about the helmet of salvation. Uh, it should make a difference to us that we're saved. Uh, God has given us righteousness. You know, you know, he says the breastplate of righteousness. We're justified. We're declared righteous. That should change our heart. Uh, God has given us the, the truth. He talks about the belt of truth. Uh, you know, we don't have to go by our emotions. We can go by the truth. Uh, he's given us our feet shed, not shed, shod. shod. <laughs> I couldn't think of the right word. Uh, shod with the, the gospel of peace. Uh, we have the gospel. You know, that's something that we can take to others. We have, the, the, we have faith. We have the scripture, uh, the sword of the spirit. You know, that will help us to be sober. It'll help us to have a right uh, thoughts and actions uh, in our heart and life if we'll see what God has done and, and, and use these truths. Uh, the third thing, we need to not sleep. We need to use God's armor. Back to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and, and verse 13. This is a verse we looked at a few weeks ago. We need to control our thoughts. First uh, Corinthians, First uh, Peter one verse thirteen says, "Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ." We need to gird up the loins of our mind. Uh, don't just give way to despair. <laughs> you know. We decide what we're going to think, and we need to realize that. Don't just, uh, you know, don't, like I said before, be asleep at the wheel and think, oh, it's, it's all just coming at you. No, it's, there's things in, in your heart and mind that you control, and one of them is your thoughts. And uh, we need to be careful uh, that we understand we do have hope. There's no reason for us as Christians to be hopeless. Uh, he talks there about be sober and hope to the end for the grace uh, that God has, has, has given us. Well, the, the fourth thing, 1 Peter 4, verse 7, this is really, really basic. Uh, we need to pray. He says in 1 Peter 4, 7, The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Yeah, it's what, what God uh, wants us, us to do. These are some things that, that will help us uh, in, in being sober, in having a right heart before God. And it all has to do, there's a verse in Ephesians, Ephesians 3, verse 16. It all has to do with strengthening the inner man. Ephesians 3, verse 16 says, That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You know, as Christians, uh, if we'll be sober... If we'll do these things that God is, is saying, uh, God will, will help us to be stronger and to be maturing and, and growing in our walk with Him. Uh, we need to be sober. We need to be strong in the Lord. The, the second thing he says, not only be sober, he says be vigilant. Now there's a difference between the two. Uh, let me read verses 8 and 9 again there in, in 1 Peter 5. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. I'll just, I'll just stop reading there. Uh, be vigilant. Being sober involves watching out for what's inside of us. 
Being vigilant involves watching out for what's outside of us. We're, we're looking around. And he mainly focuses here on our enemy, the devil. Now, this is important for us to understand. Now, there are some things we need to know about our enemy. One of the worst enemies you'll face is an unknown enemy. But God has, has told us about the devil. And God has given us information. Let me give you three things about uh, Satan tonight. Number one, respect him. He's dangerous. If you come across a snake, they, they say here in Australia, if you come across a snake, assume that it's poisonous. <laughs> uh, respect it is what, what they're saying. It don't, don't goof around with it. Don't mess with it. Um, well, the devil's the same. Listen, uh, the devil is, is powerful. Uh, the devil is uh, God's enemy. And uh, we need to understand he's dangerous. There's, there's a couple of verses in Ephesians chapter 6 where it talks about our stand against the devil. He puts it this way, uh, Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The three things he, he says there that indicate Satan is a powerful foe. He says we need to be strong in the Lord. We need to be in the power of his might. We need to put on his armor. God's saying, uh, this, is not, this is not play here. We're not goofing around. Uh, this is a battle. And uh, you need to, to take the power of the Lord uh, in this thing. Uh, he's called a serpent. Uh, he's called a lion. Ephesians 2 calls him the prince of the power of the air. He most certainly is not a joke. You know, the world likes to picture Satan as with horns and a tail and, and so on. Listen, the Bible says he's an angel of light. He, he's lovely. He's beautiful. Uh, in, in looks, if, if we could see him. Uh, there's no, no comic character about this. Jesus had said to Peter, Peter, Satan desires to have you and sift you like wheat. Now, Peter learned the hard way that Jesus meant what he said. Uh, you know, Peter sometimes would correct the Lord when he'd say things like that. And he was the one who, when Jesus told him to pray, he went to sleep. Uh, when Jesus told him to do one thing, he pulled out his sword and attacked a fellow. Uh, Peter said, oh, I'll never deny you. And then he denied the Lord. You see, it, it's a battle we're in. And Satan wants to, to, defeat, to defeat us. Uh, respect him. He's, he's dangerous. But on the other hand, don't overestimate him. Uh, listen, Satan is not God. Uh, Satan is not everywhere at once. He's not all-powerful. Uh, Satan is, is a created being. Uh, he's limited. He can only be in one place at one time. If he's bothering you, he's not bothering me. And now he does have, he does have demons that, that work for him. But on the other hand, don't be mindless about it. Now, I use that expression. I got that from somebody else. There's a lot of mindlessness about spiritual things in our day and age. Um, there's a lot of things that people just make up uh, about demons and demonism um, and, and about spiritual things in general. Uh, we're living in a day when the charismatic movement has just made a, a mockery of, of many things that, that are spiritual. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us to grow in knowledge. Grow in knowledge. Uh, get what you know from God. Uh, don't just make it up. Uh, the psalmist said, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. God said that. Uh, we need to go to God, not to uh, mysticism and so on. A few years ago, there was a man named Peretti who wrote a book about demonism. And, and it just made, it, demons did everything. If your car quit running, it was a demon. If, you're, you know, if you tripped, it was a demon. If, everything was a demon. Now, I, there's demons. And, and I've uh, had, you know, we've had times when we believe that we've confronted people that were demon-possessed. But... Uh, Satan is not everywhere, and Satan is not everything. Um, don't, don't be mindless about it. There's, a, there, there's people who talk about binding Satan. Listen, we, we don't bind Satan. Jesus will bind Satan someday, and, and he'll be put aside for a time. But you and I don't do that. Uh, in, in the book of Jude, the Bible talks about the angel um, Michael confronting Satan. It's Jude verse 9, when... When Michael contended with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. It says, he durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Uh, our, the power we have, it, it comes from the Lord. 
And uh, we need to understand, Satan is, is a powerful being. But greater is he that's in you than, than he that's in the world. And uh, we need to understand that. Secondly, recognize him. He is a great pretender. And we need to respect him because he's, he's dangerous. But we need to recognize him because he's a great pretender. He, he doesn't want you to think of him as being part of the battle. Satan wants you to concentrate on the things happening around you rather than eternity. Uh, the word Satan means adversary. That should tell you something about him. <laughs> he is not your friend. He is your adversary. Uh, the devil, that, that means slanderer. The devil is a slanderer. And, and he, Jesus said he's a, he's a liar. He's a murderer. Uh, the Bible here where we're, we're looking in Peter calls him, uh, he's like a lion. The lions roar so that you'll run and they can, they'll attack you and devour you. Uh, I, I've, I've, not, I've never confronted a lion, but uh, on, uh, on door knocking, I've had dogs charge me. And, and I'll tell you exactly what they want. They want you to run so they can bite you in the leg. Uh, what I do, I stand there with my hands in my pocket and I look at them. I've had dogs slide to a halt at my feet, <laughs> roaring, and, and, and then they stop. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to frighten us. Uh, he, he wants to attack us. And he, he attacks particularly God. Satan is God's enemy. Uh, the Lion of Christ, as you go through the Old Testament, he was constantly on the attack in the Lion of Christ. Israel, uh, even today, Satan is, is opposing Israel. And Satan opposes believers. He, he opposes individuals. He, he opposes you. Uh, if he can get you to fail, he will. He opposes families. Satan doesn't want families to succeed. He wants people to, uh, to have problems and, and to, uh, to be contrary to each other. Uh, he opposes leaders, particularly spiritual leaders. Uh, your pastor, uh, the leaders in your church. Uh, Satan opposes churches. He doesn't want a church to have unity. You know, and when we look at things, we think, oh, so-and-so is doing something. Uh, we've got this problem here. Listen, we're in a battle. And we don't want to attack our fellow soldiers. We want to understand who the enemy is. And uh, we, need to, we need to recognize him. He's a great pretender. He'll say, oh, there's a problem in the church. No, there's not a problem in the church. There's an enemy to the church. And we need to deal with that. Uh, Satan even attacks his own followers. You, you, you need to understand that. He, he has no friends. Uh, he only helps people so that he can hurt them. Uh, and how he attacks, there, there's a lot. But one is he accuses. The Bible calls him the... the, the the slanderer, the, the accuser. Uh, the course we're doing on Wednesday nights is about noise, quieting the noisy soul. He's a big part of the noise. You know, he, he wants you to have thoughts going through your head that are accusing you. Uh, you've probably had it happen. Something that happened 20 years ago. It'll come up in your, your mind and, you, and you'll feel ashamed again. Something that you've, you've confessed and forsaken. And, uh, listen, Satan wants you to have those kinds of thoughts. Satan sows discord. Um, you know, he, he doesn't want people getting along. In our church, he, he wants there to be discord. Uh, Satan distracts. He, he would like to have you concentrating on anything other than what the Lord wants you to do. You know, in life, there's a lot of good things that we can do, but sometimes they take us away from what God wants us to do. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, he puts it uh, this way. When he says, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him that hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, when we're in a battle, listen, we can't get distracted. We need to be careful. There's, a, there's so many things that, that Satan does. He, he discourages us. Uh, he uses lies. He'll use partial truths. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll say, you're no good. Well, he, that's a partial truth. You know, Paul wrote, in me that's in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's Romans 7. But then in Romans 8, he says, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. You know, that, that, that's just a part of the truth. Uh, in, uh, in Colossians, he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Philippians, he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In Romans, God says, we're, we're justified by faith. Uh, Satan will take a, a part of the truth to condemn you and, and to discourage you. Uh, 
we need to go to God for the whole truth and, and to see what, what the truth is. Satan will discourage you from confessing sin. Satan will discourage you from serving him. You've had it happen. I have. You're going to do something for the Lord and uh, something comes up. Can't do it. We need to understand uh, who Satan is. Uh, we need to recognize him. He's a great pretender. We need to respect him. He's dangerous. But greater is he that's in, in you than he that's in the world. The third thing, verse 9, we need to resist him. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, th those words give us a, a great deal of what we're to do. Number one, resist. <laughs> Two, resist steadfast. You know, this is not something you do part-time. This is a full-time job, <laughs> all right? In the faith. Uh, we resist him by the, by the word of God. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he quoted scripture. It is written. And by the way, Satan quoted scripture back at him. <laughs> uh, the devil knows, knows the, the word of God. And then he uses the word knowing there in, in verse 9. Knowing, uh, we need to understand. We need to have a, an understanding of what God is doing. To resist the devil, the first thing to do is to submit to God. That's the very first thing. Do what's right. And, you know, submitting to God, uh, I don't know why we've, we find that a, a difficult thing. He's our lovely heavenly, heavenly Father. And yet many times... It's exactly where we've, we've got to run to. We, we sang that song, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Uh, listen, that's where we need to go when we're, we're tempted by Satan, when we're attacked, when we're uh, uh, trying to resist him. Uh, run to your heavenly Father, not away from him. Look in Ephesians chapter 6 again, if you would. Ephesians 6, and let me just read a few verses here, in, uh, verse, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Uh, we need to rely on God's strength, is what he's saying there. Our strength is in the Lord. In uh, James chapter 4 and verse, verse 7, I'm going to go back there to, to Ephesians, but James 4, 7 is a verse you know. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Uh, someone said, I, I don't know who, uh, the weakest Christian on their knees uh, makes the devil flee. We have the power of the Lord available to us. Rely on God's strength. God says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Uh, he says in, in 1 John, I wanted to get the first part of this verse because I always seem to leave it off. 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, the power of God. Uh, that's what keeps us steadfast in the faith. It's the power of the Lord. And the other part of it is, we need to join with other believers. Our relationship to other Christians is very important. Uh, we're living in a day and age where there's uh, a real downgrading of the importance of, of the local church. And uh, God says it's important. It's the body of Christ. It's important in our lives. Value your church. Now look at Ephesians 6 there, verse 18. He says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And many other verses we could look at. But our, our relationship together is important as Christians. Uh, there needs to be that unity and that, uh, that togetherness uh, that will help us. We need each other uh, for strength. It's a wonderful part. You know, it's no wonder Satan likes to cause disunity in a church. Uh, he knows that that's a, that's a place that will help us to, to do what's right. In uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 30, Paul talks about the, the conflict. He says, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. There's plenty of conflict. But listen to the next verse, chapter 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ... 
if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Be part of the consolation is our relationship together as, as Christians. We should be able to enjoy a sweet fellowship together. Uh, what a blessing to have someone to, to fellowship with, you know, to bear the load. Now, when we were starting churches, uh, one of the things that would happen when we knew that things were, were moving along in the right direction is when somebody or some family came who was on our side. You know, a lot of times, I, I don't know how others have experienced it, a lot of times when we'd start off, you'd get the, the mixed multitude, you know, the looky-loos. People would come and think they're doing a favor, you're doing a favor, you know, to come to church. And, but then you'd get somebody or a family who was on your side. That was their church. They believed the same way. They, they were headed the same direction. Uh, they spoke the same language, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, what a blessing it is when there's somebody else there uh, to help you bear the load. Uh, you know, in, uh, in Galatians, he, he uses that expression when he says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love one another. Can't do that on your own. <laughs> you got to have somebody else there. Uh, we need to be a part of a church and uh, join with, with others in resisting the devil. Uh, know whose side you're on. And one of the things he's talking about there in, in Peter, the last part of verse, uh, was it verse 9? knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He said, other people are going through these same difficulties. Uh, they need your help. You need their help. Uh, this is, you're not the only one experiencing you know, Satan's uh, opposition to, to your Christian life. And when he, when he says, resist steadfast in the faith, he says, others are, are experiencing this same thing. And, and there's victory in Jesus. Uh, we need to be careful we don't attack our teammates. Have you ever seen a team playing and they get all so mad at each other they can't, they can't play the other team? I've seen it happen. Uh, that shouldn't be. We can work things out. Uh, we can have unity. And uh, we need to know whose side we're on and we need to be on the same side together as Christians. So two things he, he gives us here tonight in being watchful. Number one, be sober. Personally, inwardly, under God's control. The other is be vigilant. Uh, don't let anything outwardly come between you and God, especially God's enemy, uh, the devil. God wants us to be watchful. Uh, I thought we'd close tonight with the song, I Surrender All, it's page 153. And uh, I thought that was a, a pretty good song about being sober. Page 153, why don't you come and lead us in song?